Welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson, our focus will be on the past pawns, what they can and cannot do. Of course, as usual, chess is a complex game, and it's rare that it's only one team that is important. And as you'll see, we'll touch upon other ideas as well, such as stalemate or other. Let's get started with our very first example. Here we go. In this position, there are several important elements going on right away. One of it is that our pawn on c7 is very far advanced and is only one square from the promotion square. The other important element is that black, with his last move, has just played a7 to a6, attacking the knight on b5. So what should white do right now? First of all, let's discuss the option of white immediately promoting the pawn to a queen. The problem here is that the black bishop from e6 can immediately capture that newly born queen. And even though the rook can capture the bishop, it does not win a bishop gain for white because white will at turn lose the knight on b5. And the best white can get out of this is win a pawn with bishop takes b5. It's one of those situations when you see a good option, look around and see if you have a much better one. In this position, white indeed can do better than just winning a pawn. The next step would be to look into a scenario how and if possible to remove this bishop from guarding the promotion square. One option would be to right now move the rook to e8. And then if pawn takes knight, give up our rook for the bishop, which certainly would work well if black will respond by pawn takes rook, allowing the white pawn to get promoted. However, by no means is black forced to now capture the rook on e6, but can do better by capturing the pawn on c7. And then, again, the best white can do is just win one pawn by playing rook b6. Again, we found a second way to win a pawn, but nothing more. Let's go back again and try to figure out what we may be able to do to do better. We have to recognize that if the white knight would move away from the attack, that would leave all of a sudden the pawn on c7 unprotected. Therefore, again, it's not the ideal choice. If you can figure out what the correct move here is, you can certainly be proud of yourself. And that correct move is playing rook to b8 right now. All of a sudden threatening the black rook, and if rook takes rook, then our advanced pawn can capture that rook and promote to b8. And now, even though the black pawn can capture the white knight on b5, white's gain is tremendous, having a queen versus black's second bishop, giving white a six-point advantage already. That's quite a bit more than winning a pawn as we saw in the previous options. Getting back to the position after rook b8, black can capture the knight immediately, but that will result in leaving the rook unprotected. And then on the next move, the white rook will come back to b8, and after that promote the c pawn, so when bishop will take the queen, the rook will take the bishop, leaving white with a full rook's advantage. Let's move on to a next example, which is quite different than the one we just saw. In this example, white has again a far advanced pass pawn just one square away from promotion. However, black has a rook. Black at the moment has tremendous material advantage. Moreover, both the black rook and king on g6 are attacking that g7 pawn. 
it seems that no matter what white moves, and in fact only the white king has a legal move at this moment, that pawn will be lost, giving white a full rook's advantage and eventually the win. However, if you move the king to f8, king rook g7, and that certainly is the case. But the key is to move the king to the corner. Now, if black would attempt to checkmate with rook a8, white can block the check by, in fact, promoting the pawn and forcing an absolutely drawn game. On the other hand, after king h8, if black captures the pawn as planned, that will result a stalemate position and ends the game immediately in a draw with rook g7. A very nice stalemate and a nice escape for white from losing the game. Let's move on to the next example. In this case, white has an advanced pawn on h6, but the problem is its advancement seems to be blocked by black's bishop on g8. If you look at the material balance, we realize that black is an extra bishop up. What can white do? Well, white has only two legal moves, either moving the king out of the corner or advancing the pawn and losing it. If white continues with the safe and normal looking king to b1, black slowly but surely will bring his own king to the game and will end up winning. On the other hand, white can do better, namely by playing h7, giving that pawn up and achieving an immediate stalemate and draw in this position. Let's go on to our next example. Here we go. In this position, if it were white's turn, white could immediately advance the f-pawn to f7 and announce checkmate. The situation looks pretty dangerous for black. What can black do to save the game? In addition, the black bishop on d6 is under immediate attack also. The white king threatens to capture. Fortunately for black, after capturing the pawn on e7, he can save the game. And the reason again is stalemate. If pawn captures bishop, Black has no legal moves, yet not in check. Result, stalemate. No other move would work here for black, because on any other bishop move, the pawn advance would be checkmate. Let's move on and away from stalemates a little bit. Here we go. In this position, the white queen on e3 is under attack, and as we can see, both sides have pawn running, about to be promoted. If white right now would immediately promote the pawn to a queen, then black would have the opportunity to promote his own pawn to make it a queen as well with a check. And white certainly would be nowhere near winning this game. Also, if white promotes the pawn to a queen, black had the option to capture the white queen. So the logical idea would be, in such a situation, to try to move away the queen with a check and then try to promote our pawn. For example, capturing the pawn on f2 and then when the king moves out, pawn to promote. The problem is, however, that the white queen left the e-file and that means that the white pawn on e7 is no longer protected and the black king will capture it and black is through the worst. So what may white still do here? Well, one option could be to try to move the queen away, prevent or at least try to hold off the black pawn from promoting and in the meantime hang on to the pawn on e7. Here the black king coming to f7 would not stop 
the white pawn from promoting and white would easily win here. However, the big problem after queen e2 is that the black queen would move to e1, giving a check. Now if the white king moves out, obviously the white queen is lost. Or if queen captures queen, black would capture back and promote at the same time the pawn to a queen, followed by then capturing white's pawn on e7. Let's go back again to the starting position. This is a real tricky one when we use one of those unusual options when a pawn decides to underpromote. What that means is that white, for a good reason, chooses to promote the pawn to a lesser value piece than optimal, namely the queen, and in this case white promotes the pawn to a knight. Why? In order to give a check and gain time. As you can see, right now the black king is in check. Therefore, black does not have the time to either capture the white queen on e3 or to promote the f-pawn to a queen. Now, black has two types of options. One is to move to kind of a random square, which then would allow white to capture the pawn. And now white has not only a pawn, but also a knight advantage. Or the other option is for black to move the king to f7. So then if white would capture the pawn on f2, the black king could capture the knight. But white can do better. After the black king would move to f7, white now has at his disposal a second check. Very important, forcing the black king to move again, and then white will be safe to simply capture the pawn and eventually win the game. After this tricky example, let's move on to our next example. Here we go. In this bishop end game with equal number of pawns, the situation seems pretty even. White has a far advanced pawn though on b6 and that always invites some special circumstances or tactics. If that pawn right now would capture on c7, black would capture back and at the same time protect the pawn on a5. If white would capture the pawn on a5 right away, then black would capture the pawn on b6 and attack white's bishop and again equalize the material balance. This is a real tricky situation where white's main objective is to promote the b pawn to a queen. And as so often in such situations, white doesn't mind a temporary loss of material, that is, to sacrifice his most valuable piece, just in order to make sure that that B pawn gets promoted. The beautiful move is to play bishop to h4, attacking black's bishop, and now if bishop captures on h4, then already pawn captures on c7, followed by the c pawn promoting. As black has a dark squared bishop, there is no possible way for that bishop ever to guard any square that's light colored. After bishop h4, if black would try to capture the pawn, white would capture the bishop with a clearly winning advantage. And lastly, after bishop h4, black can try to block it and play g5. But guess what? White will use the same idea again and capture the pawn on g5. Same ideas, the black bishop is under attack now, and if bishop captures bishop, pawn takes, and white's pawn is unstoppable. Let's move on. Here we go. In this case, white again has a very far advanced pass pawn, and white has just moved the king to e6, which was a mistake, to attack the rook on f7. Black now has a dilemma, which rook should capture white's pawn? While one is winning, 
the other one give, would give white the advantage. Here is the trick. If black would choose to capture with the rook from e8, then white would capture the pawn, and after rook takes rook, which seemingly won the rook, white would have a counter skewer, forcing the black king to move away from the seventh rank, and then capture black's rook with a clearly advantageous position, as white already won a pawn and likely to win a second one. Going back to our initial position, therefore, it's clear that the other rook is the one to capture. And regardless which black pawn white captures right now, then rook captures rook, and neither rook is in a skewer situation, and in fact, the two black rooks nicely connect to each other and protect each other. So therefore, black's material gain is quite significant. Let's follow up with the next example. Here we go. In this situation, it was black's turn. Right now, if black would trade rooks, that would result a theoretical drawn position, as if pawn advances, the white king gets there just on time to capture the promoted pawn on a1. Also, if black would simply move the rook away, the white king would get towards the corner and such endgames where the white king is on a1 or b1 and the rook along with it on the first rank, black actually cannot make any progress. However, black still has a winning move here, but only if they find the correct move. And that move is to advance the pawn to a2. What is happening right now? The pawn is about to get promoted on a1. And any of the choices that white would try would result in losing significant material. For example, if king takes rook, pawn promotes. And now white has a queen versus a rook, which is a four-point advantage. And moreover, it's a winning endgame. I agree, it's not the easiest way to win, but if you play well, it's definitely a winnable position. After a2, if the rook captures the pawn, then through an x-ray, the rook has actually protected that pawn. And now, black has an easily winning king and rook versus king endgame. After a2, if white tries to catch the pawn by playing king b2, then the problem is simply rook takes rook, and now if the king takes back, then again the pawn can promote, or if it doesn't, but plays king a1, then black will win, although I have to point out that black has to be careful, and in fact black cannot hang on to his pawn on a2, because if they would try to, the position would be stalemate. So in this situation, you purposefully would want to give that pawn up by moving the rook back somewhere, king captures, then for example play rook b3, corner the king, make sure the king doesn't run out, play king c3, followed by king c2, and voila, after king a1, black is ready to checkmate with rook a3. Let's move on. To our next example. In this position, we do see again a nice far advanced pass pawn on b7, only one square away from promotion. However, we also see that two of the black pieces, the king as well as the rook from h8, they are both controlling that promotion square. So it wouldn't make any sense to right away advance that pawn because the pawn would become history immediately. But what can white do? It's really hard to deflect either piece. And yet there is a way, and it's a very typical pattern, so it's good to remember it. The move is to play rook d8. A beautiful move, threatening to advance the pawn safely. But what happens if the rook captures our rook? 
Well, what happens then is we'll capture again, renewing the threat to promote the pawn, and now the best black can do is capture the rook, and then that means that the king, nor the rook, longer protect the promotion square. White promotes the pawn, and the resulting endgame is very easily winning for white, not just because of the material advantage that white accumulated, but also because the black king will get checkmated real soon. For example, if the bishop blocks, queen moves to d6 check, now the king has no legal move, only move is to block the check, and game over, checkmate. One more time, after rook d8, rook d8, rook d8, king d8, pawn advances to a queen, if king e7, instead of the bishop blocking, then queen c7, king f8, and queen d8 again decides the game. And here is our last position in this lesson. Here we go. Again, in this bishop and game, we have even material. And white's pass pawn on a6 is certainly further advanced than black's pawn that can potentially become pass pawn after g4. It was black's turn in this position, and black made a mistake by playing a very natural move. Black should be safe in this game if the king, for example, would move to b8. But black moved the king to b6. Going after white's pawn looks like a very natural move trying to capture the pawn. White cannot protect the pawn. And yet, white has a way to win this position with a very tricky move. Bishop to a5. Look at that. It's a skewer. And the reality is that the white bishop is indirectly protected because if king takes bishop, then the a pawn runs away and is unstoppable of becoming a queen. On the other hand, after king b6, bishop a5, king takes pawn, white wins the bishop, and then after g4, white will not trade pawns because that would leave white with a bishop only and you cannot win with a bishop and king only. So therefore it's crucial to keep the last pawn on the board and fortunately for white after g3 the bishop can arrive just on time to control the promotion square and then easily win by the king going after the pawn. Also if after king b6, bishop a5, king a6, bishop d8, g4, h4, black tries to be tricky and play king b7 preventing the bishop from getting to c7, then either the white king or bishop of course can still easily catch that pawn in time. Well, I hope after this lesson you got a bit better idea on how to deal with past pawns and how dangerous past pawns can be. They can enable combinations that otherwise would not be possible. Well, that's all for this lesson. Thank you for listening and be back next week for some more chess goodies. Bye-bye.